So, uh, well, thank you very much for uh, having us. Uh, uh, Bruce and I have just been honored to be here and really enjoying the program and the interactions. Um, so my name is Larry Reagan. I'm from Penn State University at a Center for Online Innovation and Learning, which is a research and development hub for new ideas around um, how online innovations can impact our learning spaces. And I'm, uh, Bruce, do you want to introduce now or do you want to wait until you? So when Bruce comes up. So our topic uh, really grows out of a program that we've been running for five years now, a relationship between Penn State University and Sloan C. Uh, Bruce and I have served as co-directors for uh, several years on this program. And as it has grown, as the program has grown and evolved, uh, we've developed a, a kind of a observations of forces that are, that are impacting today's leaders in online learning. And uh, we want to share a little bit of our findings with you and have some dialogue and some exchanges. It's really uh, interesting to us to know if this is the set of forces that we feel in the U.S., in the U.S. context, what do you feel in whatever context you might be sitting in? So we're hoping today that we can have that exchange and dialogue. I think Malcolm may have mentioned that we're not going to have a set time for questions at the end. We'd like to build those into the program as we go. So be prepared to uh, hopefully be engaged. In order to do this, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background on the Institute, but I'm not going to go into great detail right now, but I think it's important for you to just know sort of the setting. We use this uh, thematically throughout our program, which is to really uh, ask individuals who are taking a step into a leadership role to think about things from a very personal level. What do I think about leadership? Then talk about how that personal explanation or, or understanding of leadership expresses itself at the local level. So what can you do? How do you operate within the framework of an academy or, or an organization? And finally then, and this is the one I think for both has been most interesting and stimulating in the last couple of years, is about thinking globally. One thing we've learned, and we, we were just talking about this last evening, we're reminded time and time again that 20 years ago, 40 years ago, we thought about our institutions as landlocked institutions. Our competition was really the competition 50 miles from campus, not, you know, not someplace in Saudi Arabia or, or in the UK or wherever. Today's environment is very different, which calls upon a different set of skill sets for leaders needing to think about things in a broader context. So very quickly, we joined, as I said, in, in uh, 2009 was our first year. It's a shared effort. We share faculty members. Uh, that is, we select faculty who uh, represent the th leading thought uh, individuals uh, in the industry. We invite them to participate. We typically have six to seven faculty members per offering uh, of the program. Uh, we are addressing the next cadre of online learners. Uh, Bruce will often say, if you look around the room, you know, we're not getting any younger. Uh, our, our generation is beginning to, to look toward retirement, which means uh, thinking about how are we preparing that next cadre, the next uh, level of, of online leaders. The mainstreaming of online learning has increasingly become a theme of the program as uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people were still trying to figure out what online learning meant and where it fit into the ecosystem. Uh, and today, uh, the numbers of institutions who don't have an online learning strategy are in the minority. Um, we already mentioned the graying of the online leadership. Oh, this, this career path uh, topic is kind of interesting for us because when we started the program just five short years ago, which I guess in internet time is like, what, maybe 50 years ago, let's call it, um, we had mostly individuals coming to the program who had not studied online. Most had some experience teaching or had some capacity, but they came from other fields. Uh, they were perhaps a director of an AV unit first or, or maybe a faculty member in a particular college. Today what we're seeing then is, a, is uh, it, are individuals coming to the online learning program who are beginning to represent the, the in, people who have had experiences in online learning. So more and more we're seeing people who have degrees from online institutions or in some cases, as we saw this year, have 
a significant amount of years um, in, the, in the domain itself and now are being asked to step into a leadership role. And, and lastly is this topic of four forces of change. We really try to help uh, the participants understand all of the dynamics, at least from a, uh, an ability to think about and talk about these forces. And, and this is what Bruce is really going to talk to you about. Um, framing this out, we're going to be looking at three things. We're going to be looking at that personal uh, level, the institutional level, but we're going to start with the global level. And Bruce is going to walk us through uh, understanding how these impact us uh, a little bit in, in terms of preparing to be an effective leader in online learning. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and good friend, Bruce Chalou. Uh, as Larry said, uh, we're going to flip the, the framing uh, device here. I'm going to run through over the next couple of minutes some of the, our findings, if you will. Some of them are based upon uh, cl the clear interaction we've had with uh, our participants as Larry said, up to 170 or so now. Uh, but also um, from uh, research and in interaction with a variety of folks from uh, our com uh, community. So global forces. Um, one of the, and, I, and I have to admit, these are global forces a bit from a US perspective. Most of the students who participate, colleagues who participate in the institute are in fact uh, individuals from US colleges and universities. There's a, there's a significant challenge in the U.S. right now about the value proposition of higher education. Uh, it plays out essentially as is the investment of time and money that our young people are making in higher education for this credential actually paying the dividends that uh, it should. Uh, I have to say that in the U.S. this is probably the first time in, the, in maybe 50 years where we've started to have uh, questions, very deep-rooted questions by policymakers being raised about uh, the value of higher education. I think we have generally floated along as an industry, if I can use that term, and um, there was no question people needed to move into post-secondary education in the U.S., not a question about the, the value proposition, but it is now, in part driven by the enormous cost to attend a college and university uh, or university in the U.S., and it used to be just in the private sector, it is now in the public sector as well. So pricing is a, is a huge issue. This historical uh, cultural le uh, legacy of the academy, the traditional academy, uh, is under some uh, uh, change, significant change as well uh, in the US. And, and uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how we define the academy over the next uh, decade because in, indeed it is changing quite significantly. I'll, I'll comment on that a little bit more uh, momentarily. Uh, we're having uh, interesting questions about uh, what learning experiences should be, how long they should be. The traditional 15 or 16 week semester is a little bit under attack. Uh, in some measure, back to this point about the value proposition, uh, time in seat is a cost. And the idea that it's going to take you eight semesters of full-time study to complete a four-year baccalaureate degree, which is, used to be the standard, is, is, the standard now is 150% of time, so over six years. And we have in the U.S., I'm not proud to say this, uh, we have some 50 million working age adults, 25 to 62, although the age of work has ex being extended more and more, 50 million of them have some college credit and no degree. And we're working with a number of institutions to try to turn that 50 million, not into a deficit, but into a market. Uh, and in fact, online strategies are, are being utilized. The second component of this is who grants the credential. Um, most of you have probably heard about badging. Badging has become amazingly popular. We introduced it to our IELL group this year, and uh, it's amazing how many of them are saying, well, I'm going to finish this because there's a badge attached to it. And we've kind of laid out a five-badge uh, strategy. The badges, in some instances now, are being turned into academic credit. The credit is being applied towards a degree, and who gives the credential is becoming uh, more and more significant. Democratization of learning. It used to be the case that we would come to a university, such as University of Nottingham, 
uh, and our faculty would be generating research and findings, and the students would come to the university and we would deliver our findings uh, sitting in a traditional classroom like this. You can Google just about anything these days. And in fact, there, you do not need to come to the traditional campus. Uh, so there has been a kind of a flip, if you will, in terms of how we can acquire, how we can access, where we access uh, knowledge and, uh, and learning. So there's a democracy at play here. Uh, none of you, of course, have any reduction in funding, right? And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, I've read a few headlines about the UK, it's getting a little bit more expensive for your students to attend uh, university uh, in this country. Uh, welcome to our world. We've been in this world for the last 25 or 30 years. As I mentioned, our, we've, got this, we've got this double issue now, double jeopardy, if you will, of not only having uh, dramatic uh, increases in uh, the price or cost, it's been pushed in some measure by reductions, particularly in the public sector, uh, of, uh, of support or resources. So the policymakers in the US continue to extol the virtues of higher education at the same time slashing budgets. And they've essentially said to institutions, you folks make up the difference. And so we've seen huge tuition and, and fee increases, uh, which has become a huge burden uh, for many families uh, and, and uh, uh, and students. Uh, the online markets continue to grow. These are, in fact, global in nature. They become much more competitive. Launch a program, uh, reach students. Uh, we used to be reaching students. Hello, John. We used to be reaching students. <laughs> uh, we used to be reaching students uh, uh, locally, then regionally, then nationally, and now uh, internationally. And uh, particularly at the graduate level, the competition for institutions that are launching. Uh, online graduate programs is intense, quite intense. Uh, whoops, excuse me. We have this fascinating situation where, where um, we were in London earlier in the week and we, we saw that there was a Pepperdine University office right across the street at Imperial uh, uh, in one of those marvelous flats. Uh, we saw that Fordham University from the U.S. has a presence uh, that's not to say that U.S. institutions are still not reaching out across the globe, uh, but they can reach out in far better ways using the technology, and indeed the students have that same capability. So there's far greater mobility both in terms of institutions and who they serve and where they serve them and the learners. And the last point I want to make uh, on, the, on this global force component relates very directly to the comment I made earlier about, uh, about particularly uh, graduate programming. We have had this historical, at least in the U.S., challenge. This pendulum kind of swings back and forth uh, on the liberal arts versus vocational education or education that would lead to, uh, directly to vocation. That pendulum has swung well away from the liberal arts now, uh, in part driven by uh, increasing demands on institutions to make sure that the students who graduate from uh, colleges and universities in the U.S are in fact uh, employable, have marketable skills. And so many of these programs have become much more applied in nature. And again, at the graduate level, the uh, expansion of particularly MBA programs, uh, engineering programs, online or in blended formats uh, has increased pretty significantly. So those are eight kind of global forces at play. And if I click this button, Larry can explain to you what this means, because I can't. So we were. Uh interested in looking at this, per, the, this issue of the global forces and learning a little bit about how your institutions are dealing with what are the forces that are enacting on your institutions as well. And that's where we want to get a little feedback of, because we're kind of checking bases here. Are you dealing with the same kinds of uh, pressures uh, that, that, that global, at the global level as we are or, or are there are different unique uh, issues that you're dealing with? So um, if I can, now we're going we're gonna to need to get a mic to you. And I understand we have mic runners. Is that correct? We have uh, people who are going to use mics? Yes. Would you come up, please? We've got two. <coughs> okay. So um, as we're getting the mics there, I have to tell you, at our institution, this issue of globalization at Penn State has a, has a very real presence as well. So we, we feel it in, in how we have to make decisions. 
even for Jan's Open University in the Netherlands. I think it depends on the language in which you're teaching. As a small language area, we don't feel the same. Well, not we feel pressure as well from outside, um, but most of our students are still Dutch speaking, so that somehow limits competition. Interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Okay. So the language itself creates kind of a smaller geography, if you will. All right. Interesting. Other uh, thoughts, questions? Well, the, our forces different. I think what we're trying to drill down to a little bit are these forces that we outline, and there are others, but certainly stopping at eight is a pretty reasonable number. Uh, are you engaged in dealing with, troubled by? Um, I was just going to say we have... Um, do you tell us who you are, please? Oh, uh, Sandra Partington from City University, so right in the centre of London. And we have a lot of postgraduate courses, and they really are uh, students from all over the world. Mm. So they do, you know, as soon as terms finished, they go back mm -hmm. all over the world again. So they more and more want the whole thing to be online. You know, mm -hmm. even though they are coming physically, they sure. still... Um, around all over the place as soon as the mm -hmm. lessons are over. So, so you're, you're feeling a force from your constituent base, your students, yeah. demand yeah. for More continued online. access. Things like especially yeah. uh, assessment and feedback, mm -hmm. results online, feedback online, quickly and globally accessible. That's and how is one. City in responding? Are you putting together programs that serve their needs? Because yeah, if not, we yeah. have some that we'd like to offer. <laughs> yeah, trying to extend, you know, and uh, something, job, you know, like encouraging people to mark online and do their feedback digitally, which can be quite, you know, doesn't suit all lecturers, um, yeah. but it really does suit a lot of the students. So it's tipping that way now to make that, make more of an effort to hand things back and communicate, especially, as I say, marking uh, and feedback. Sandra, if I, if I can just extend that a little bit, because I'm curious about the, this particular force. Um, is it happening now, or do you foresee it happening where this uh, desire for the online component will begin to change what you do in the face-to-face -face component? Do you know what I mean by that? I, I do. I just don't know how uh, it, it's you know big. I don't know if I could comment. For yeah. Okay. Everyone. But I was just curious. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Malcolm. And then we have. We got two more hands. Hi, Malcolm Ryan, formerly of the University of Greenwich. Oh, yes. Um, just to follow up with the question that you you just asked about. Does going online change what happens face to face? I, I'm not sure if, if you're aware in the UK over maybe the last three or four years, there has been a growth in the idea of blended, blended. learning. Yeah, sure. What I think is very interesting about that is, is the flexibility of the definition of blended learning. Mm. Some people at the base level think that just means, well, you carry on doing what you did very much right. face to face and you put things online that people can access or not. Yeah. But I think more sophisticated use of blended learning where um, people have thought very carefully mm. about the affordances of the technology, as Diana Lorillard speaks about, sure. and have actually used the online elements to do things that you might not be able to do or do as well face to face. And I think the more, sen the more complex decisions made around that, I think the better the actual learning experience would be. But I don't think many people are doing it. Mm. But it's, it's a force to be reckoned with. We'll have one more here, and then we're going to ask Bruce to move to the next level. But we're we're going to get you in. Go ahead. Oh, oh thank. Uh, sorry. Go. Charlotte Cork from the uh, Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, I just wanted to say that your final point about the the vocational uh, importance of vocational courses uh, that's absolutely been the case at our university. It has, yeah. um, I'm actually from the careers department, and we run a World of Work Skills Certificate, which it was originally an optional extra thing that students could do on top of their degree. Uh, we got reasonable good take up, but the university took the decision two years ago to make it the first stage of that program compulsory for every level four, every first year student coming in. So we've just come, we're just starting now the second year of running that, but that's 5,000 students doing an employability focused program. 
Uh, so it's very, very high on the agenda at our university. Sat in your session yesterday, and it was, it was, it was really very uh, informative, very educational to learn more. So I, I, I appreciate your comment. We're going to slip this question in as well, and then I'll, 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 I'll catch up. Uh, Roy Williams, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Roy Williams, University of Portsmouth. Um, I've seen some interesting research recently uh, in relation to free future learning, uh, and that says that. There's a divide, I don't know what the figures are on the divide, but there's a divide between students who want to engage with UK universities for the whole English experience, whatever that is, but it's an enculturation process. They would like to become encultured, whatever mm -hmm. they think that mm -hmm. is, Interesting. okay? So they want to be here, wherever here is. Sure. And they want to get those goods, whatever those goods are. And then there's another whole group who don't actually care about the enculturation, uh, they might get the enculturation where they are, or it might not be relevant to them, and they just want, as it were, the technical skills. Sure. So there seems right. to be a split in yeah. the demands of those people. The interesting question is, and I think it goes back to what Malcolm was saying, can online learning give them some of the enculturation goods that they're after? I think it can some, but I think it can't others. Yeah, I... I, I um Actually, have six grandchildren. The oldest is 12. Um, he will go off to university. We live in Atlanta, so maybe he'll go off to Georgia Tech, very fine institution. What my, I want him, and I'm not anti-campus at all. I mean, I, I love our campuses. Our campuses must continue to exist for a lot of the reasons you just mentioned. But the instructional activity and how the teaching and learning environment is created at a place like Georgia Tech or any other institution, I think is going to be the, the change. I, I, my hope is that he does not get put into a 500 seat theater as he stands in front of a 500 seat theater here uh, and, and someone lectures to him 50 minutes uh, three times a week. Uh, and I know that's not what is happening at a place like Georgia Tech where they are, students are heavily engaged in, in technology. Uh, so, so I do see that um, the need to, to uh, create a cultural environment. I think that is clearly part of, a, a, if you will, a traditional um, university experience. But the instructional activities within it, I think, are changing and, in fact, need to change. So don't get me too far off on that. Let's talk about institutional forces. A few of these things that you mentioned are going to come up. Um, we're into... Uh, we have a lot of uh, attorneys, too many attorneys in the US. In fact, I, I mentioned this notion of trying to uh, reduce time and seat. Uh, President Obama came out a week or 10 days ago and said law school, which has historically been a three-year experience, needs to be pushed to two years. Uh, and there was a hue and cry from law schools. And why was there a hue and cry? Because our entire model, our entire institutional model, and take it out of law school, put it in almost in any institution, is tied to how many individuals we, how many seats we put in seats, whether those are real seats or virtual seats. And if you start playing with that formulation, then you've got a challenge on the revenue side, on the resource side. Uh, and, and despite that, the movement clearly in the US is, is clearly kind of go, going back to the 60s, We've gone retro with competency-based uh, activities. So this notion of the contract for learning or with the learner is changing. Obviously, the financial impact of online learning, I'm, I'm going to catch up here, make one quick comment. Uh, with the internet revolution, if you go back into the mid-90s and through the early 2000s, online learning, e-learning in the US was promoted with policymakers as a way to save money. We can give you a quality educational experience, but we're not going to charge you to mow the grass, to keep the lights on, to do all of those other things. Yes, there were fees, technology fees was the term that was used, uh, but students typically were paying maybe a little bit less than what they would be paying if they were attending university in a more traditional face-to-face -face manner. That model is uh, it's 20 years old and it's, still, it's just not applicable anymore. And what is happening in the U.S. market, particularly at the graduate level, come on in, uh, is what we call market pricing. What will the market bear? 
what can I put uh, my Duke University Executive MBA online international or global program uh, on, uh, on the market for over 100,000 US. Uh, and then seven miles away from Durham in lovely Chapel Hill, North Carolina is the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, a marvelous public university. If you go to the campus, the MBA program is probably $15,000. If you take it online, it's $50,000, and it's approaching $100,000 for their global online program, which is about the cost of what is happening with the Duke Executive MBA program. So the market strategy or market pricing uh, um, strategy has changed. Uh, you c had to mention MOOCs. Um, I'm not sure what else I want to say about MOOCs other than uh, this fascinating bandwagon whether it is uh, evolutionary, revolutionary, uh, I, it's going to change our thinking. What the next iteration of MOOCs will be is very unclear, that it's going to impact how we do our business, certainly in the States, uh, it is uh, without question, without question going to happen. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, Larry and I, this is one of the things we were talking about last night. Uh, historically, the number of students that you teach in a class, the full-time equivalent student credit hours that you generate are tied to 20 or 25, depending upon the level of the course. Occasionally, we'll get a large lecture kind of activity. But generally, faculty want to teach classes with 18, 20, 22, 24. And, they, and most institutional policy is wrapped around that number. And so now, how do we react to Sebastian Thrun teaching 150,000 students in his artificial intelligence uh, MOOC some time ago, or the tens of thousands of students who were engaged in, uh, in MOOC classes. And the policymakers in the U.S. are now saying, no, so wait a minute. Faculty are saying, we can't teach more than 25. How can this faculty member be teaching 150? And it's free. So you have to think about the policy uh, uh, notions here and what our policymakers are saying. Lifelong learning, uh, I think one of the, one of the true uh, attributes, one of the beauties of online learning is its potential to serve uh, learners throughout a lifetime. Uh, in fact, I think that's really the great spot for MOOCs. It's this notion of uh, continuing uh, the learning experience uh, for individuals uh, who have a particular interest or a particular need. Uh, this relates to one of the global aspects. This notion of return on investment is driving a lot of uh, the data collection and driving a lot of the discussion uh, around policy uh, in the US. What is it costing you to send your, uh, your uh, children to, uh, uh, off to university? And what is the return on investment, uh, both from the learner, from the investment that governments are making in the public sector? Um, it is not something that we actually have done quite uh, 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 as good a job as we need to on. Um, we have a huge issue with retention in the U.S. I mentioned that earlier number of 50 million working age adults who have some college, no degree. We're bringing them back to degrees in part because they are now working, they have families, and we are engaged with them uh, in programs that meet, uh, that meet their needs. Um, we still need to do a better job of, uh, of having those complete when, uh, when they, in fact, can uh, complete. Uh, and that number, as I've said to some colleagues, of 50 million, we need to reduce, but it's going to take, uh, it's going to take decades for, for us to, in fact, get uh, to that point. One other quick comment on that. Uh, I think it used to be the case where institutions and maybe even those in the policy environment would say it's the student's problem. The fact that the student didn't finish is that he or she didn't have the wherewithal, didn't have the resources, had an issue at home, it's them. And I think we have probably um, put to feel the notion that this is all about students. There are not 50 million U.S. students who couldn't cut it. Uh, in fact, many of them are coming back and are doing quite well. Um, and then, Larry, I'm going to stop on, I'll just make one quick comment about disruptive forces. Uh, I think we probably, uh, one of the centerpieces of the discussion at this conference and at most of our conferences has been about uh, disruptive forces of technology uh, and the changes in pedagogy 
uh, which could we go into our own, our own session on that. So let me stop there on institutional forces, and Larry's going to take another temperature. I think maybe what we'll do is have you go through All right. the next batch, and then we'll do a set of questions. So what he's telling me is I need to speed up. <coughs> Individual forces. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll tick these off fairly quickly. Um, part, of, part of what we are looking to do uh, with the Institute is to get our emerging leaders to think differently about uh, more broadly learning, higher education, but also uh, e-learning or, or online learning. Uh, and they should be much more progressive in their thinking. They typically want to deal not with strategic broader framed issues, but more operational kinds of questions. And we work very hard through the setup. Larry's going to take you through uh, quickly the, the program frame. Um, work very hard to try to get uh, uh, the participants to think much more strategically. That, in, that means more progressive and that means much more uh, collaborative leadership. To be aware of uh, the emerging uh, global markets. Uh, to have a much greater business orientation for a lot of the reasons that I mentioned on, under both global and local or institutional. Uh, that the demand certainly on institutions in the U.S. Uh, for financial management, for maintaining a reasoned balance between uh, resources and expenditures is, um, is significant. Uh, to be uh, quite agile, nimble, uh, if you want to use that term, in the changing waters, sometimes tsunami-like uh, of uh, higher education. Uh, this drinking from the fire hose, it's probably a U.S. term. Uh, it really relates more to we collect so much data. Um, we probably collect more data than we know what to do with the data. And we need, need to do a much better job of, of framing the case for what we're doing. And then we want our uh, future leaders to be thinking about opportunities and an orientation, far greater orientation to opportunity. So let me stop there. Now this looks like it's really taking a temperature in both C and F. So there you go, Larry. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so we're going to combine uh, just a, a quick get some feedback from you on those two. We talked about institutional forces and then also uh, forces affecting the personal level. So uh, can I ask, are, are we on the mark? Are these the same things that you're feeling in your organizations or maybe feeling personal? Do we miss anything? Is there something from your context that might be a little bit different than what we're experiencing? And Bruce, if you wouldn't mind, maybe we'll go back and leave it on a screen just to freshen the memory there. Any thoughts or comments? Do you uh, use the term drinking from the fire hose here? That, so think of the metaphor, right? You, you, you've got this amount of information flowing out. I mean, this is, we, we were talking about this last night. How do you do that as a, as a leader? How do you simply manage the volume of information, of new ideas, of new... Uh, technologies and, and have you ever felt out of it when someone says oh don't you use X pick your technology and you sit there and think well, I didn't even know that existed and it, you know it's that feeling of how do I just manage this the pace of these changes and this amount of technologies coming in it's not easy um, I asked Stephen Downs uh, who will be your speaker tomorrow uh, that question um, how do we help leaders emerging leaders do that and he he talked about you know building the network and understanding who your thought leaders are and tapping into those as guides and so forth which I thought was really sage advice how, how are you feeling about that what what other kinds of institutional uh, dynamics are going on we had a lot around the global we don't see any around the this one okay so all right I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand this back to you uh, and just keep in mind that Malcolm has a pink card, which is like a red card in football. So let's be sure we don't get that. All right. Okay. So uh, thank you, Bruce. So what we uh, in the inst in the institute this uh, we call it I E L O L. Well, we kind of joke that before you graduate from the program, that has to roll off your tongue like a like a new word. Um, I E L O L is really our uh, experience of. Uh, helping to prepare this next generation. I'm just going to give you a little bit about the format of the project of the program. Uh, frankly, our hope is that uh, people may be interested in, in uh, participating and collaborating with us on this project. Uh, one statistics that is kind of interesting to throw out is over the five years, 
We've had over eight countries represented in the, in the program, uh, including the UK, thank you, Malcolm, uh, Ireland, uh, Singapore, and uh, Australians uh, as well. So it's been a nice group. So very quickly, um, it's, it's really about a four or four, five month program. It's a blended program. Uh, it's, it begins with a two week online primer, which this year we're gonna turn to actually, I should say for 2014, will become a three week primer because of the level of engagement going on. We do an immersive experience where our, our participants travel to Penn State, which is in the center of uh, Pennsylvania for four days. That's, we call that the immersion or the intensive experience. Uh, we then send them back, and after a few weeks of getting their semesters up and running, we start a three-week online. This is where they take the lessons of the Institute, pick a particular project, and begin working on it. And uh, the goal of that is, is, is multifold. One is that you pick a project and hopefully move uh, the project along in your institution, but the other is a little bit more subtle. It's a way of getting that emerging leader some visibility within the institution. So we encourage them to work with their senior leadership and say, hey, what problem would you like me to work on for the institution? And, and by the way, when I'm done my project, I'll bring the results back to you. So you immediately get this sort of lifting of their awareness and of their visibility within the institution. Finally, we meet at the Sloan Sea Conference uh, in Orlando, that is generally in October, November timeframe, and we have a pre-conference workshop. That workshop, as much as individuals would like the opportunity to share all of their project ideas, we try to reserve for more conversation about that, that transition of moving from sort of the operational nose to the grindstone type perspective to one where you lift your chin up and you're looking at some of these broader, more global issues. Our audience is, is typically professionals in the middle or upper uh, middle management level. So typically these are people who are sort of poised for next level leadership. Uh, those individuals who, who wish to be leaders or who may have been identified as potential leaders by, by someone in their organization. <clears throat> we have a broad mix of institutions. Uh, we get profits and nonprofits. It's really interesting. Uh, and we also get uh, community colleges, uh, two-year type schools, as well as research uh, institutions. And, uh, and that mix makes it very interesting. And as I've mentioned, geographically, we've been getting more of an international draw, which I think if I've heard any one comment more than others is about the opportunity to learn and to meet people from different cultures and different contexts, which really raises your awareness of what global online learning is all about. Uh, these are the dates for next year. <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with a website if you're interested, or if you want to chat with one of us, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, there is a fee, of course, um, and that, all, that information is all contained on this website. So if you go to ielol.psu.edu, uh, it'll give you all the information about how to register, how to um, participate. And then uh, these are the emails for Bruce and I. And I think we're probably about at our time. Um, thank you so much for participating as you did and providing us feedback. We're more than interested in engaging with you on these kind of issues and topics. And I wish you an enjoyable uh, rest of the conference. So thank you.